Good morning, everyone. Thank you being, for being here, or maybe it's the afternoon, wherever you are. Welcome to Revel 11. I'm Monica Smith, a co-creator of Revel 11, along with Joni Parsons, who's also here. Good morning. And as you may know, we are a community where we try to inspire people to be the change they want to see in the world even if that means taking charge of your health, which is what we're gonna be talking about today. Our special guest this morning is the lovely Christina Tidwell, a health coach extraordinaire. I actually found Christina after researching autoimmune disorders in hopes of helping my husband, who was diagnosed with an autoimmune disorder, it took forever to get diagnosed, several years ago. Um, and Christina and I are curious about how many of you also experience autoimmune symptoms or have a loved one dealing with it. You can put it in the chat area. We're not only going to be talking about autoimmune, but it's definitely on the, you know, it seems to be, and Christina can fill us in, but it sure seems like you hear more and more about it. So we'll just be talking about being in your best health possible. Throughout our talk this morning, please feel free to write down your questions as you think of them and I'll monitor those questions. Hopefully we'll have some time at the end to ask Christina. All right, well, Christina, why don't we start by having you share your own journey to finding this important work that you do as a health coach? Yes, thank you so much, Monica and everyone for having me. I'm really excited to be spending Tuesday morning with you. Like this is this is exciting and I love speaking about this. Um, so hopefully it will be really helpful and insightful for everyone watching. That's the goal. Um, and for me, so my name is Christina Tidwell and I came to this work like many of us who are in this field because of my own experience with autoimmunity and what I learned through that. So for me, this started with when I was about 18 years old, getting really, really sick. And I had been previously pretty healthy. Like I didn't really, you know, there wasn't a lot going on for me. When I look back with hindsight, I can see different signs and signals that were telling me something was wrong. Um, along with a family who have a lot of autoimmune disease as well. Um, but at the time, I didn't really know what was going on. So what it, what it manifested as for me was getting... Um, really sick as if I had the flu. Um, I got high spiking fevers. It started out as getting fevers where I would get chills and they would get to 103, 104 um, high fevers. And then I would have these like fatigue and like muscle and, and joint aches. And I thought I had a really bad flu. So I kind of just kept going. And this can be common with us if, if we've never experienced anything like this before, we don't really know what's going on in our bodies. And so some of you listening may have had similar experiences where maybe you just start to not feel right. Maybe you feel more tired. Maybe you feel achier or you're feeling foggy and brain fog. And so for me, it was pretty acute um, and ended up getting really bad. And I ended up in the hospital trying to figure out what was going on. And I went through the whole battery of tests for, you know, many different infectious diseases, um, different autoimmune conditions. And what came back for me at the time, this has since evolved. So I, this, I'm going to talk about this too, about how it can be hard even to get a diagnosis for autoimmunity or to sometimes fit into a nice, like tidy um, disease category. But for me, it was, uh, ended up being diagnosed as juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, JRA, which then changed to a diagnosis of adult, something called adult onset stills disease, which is a bit rarer. Um, it is an auto inflammatory condition, which basically just means your innate immune system is really activated. And so that's why I was getting these huge fevers, this whole body inflammation, my every cell in my body was tired. Like if anyone's ever experienced that, um, it's not just like, okay, you take a nap and you'll feel better. It's like, whoa, every cell in my body is tired and something is not right here. Um, 
so I was diagnosed with yeah, adult onset Stills disease. I've later uh, realized down the line that um, chronic Lyme disease was part of my uh, history as well. So there's many different things that kind of came together in this moment. Um, at that time in the hospital, I ended up having a pulmonary embolism as well, a blood clot in my lung because of the inflammation and from being on hormonal birth control at that time as well. And so that kind of complicated the whole um, picture as well. So when I was discharged from the hospital, I was discharged in time to go to my high school graduation. That's what I wanted to do. And from that point on, it was just, um, I had up until that point, I had really thought if you are sick, you go to the doctor, you get a medication or a treatment, and then you leave and you get better. That was my concept of what it meant to be ill because that's how, how it had been for me in the past. In this instance, I thought the same. I thought, okay, I had this crazy huge experience, but I'll take these medications that I was given and then I'm gonna be okay. And as I continued on in that next year after this initial flare and diagnosis, that wasn't the case. I was on you know, high dose steroids and prednisone. I was on um, DMARDs, these disease modifying anti-rheumatic drugs. Um, I was on different biologic drugs, all of these things to try and turn off this giant immune response that was happening in my body. And while those medications really really did help and I needed them for that period of time in my life, I was still left feeling um, really inflamed, really tired. I had a lot of digestive issues. I had a lot of things going on under the surface. And it started to occur to me that just taking this medication wasn't going to be it. And that was really scary because I didn't know what else I could do. And so I remember going through all of this and it was probably a year after I went to see a nurse practitioner instead of my rheumatologist one day. And I told her, I had to tell her my whole story. My mom was there too. I had to tell her my, you know, the whole story. And she kind of paused after that. And she looked at me and she was like, Christina, you're 19 years old. That's a lot. How are you doing with everything? And it was so shocking to me because I promise no one had asked me that. Not because they didn't care or they didn't want to know, but because there were other things that they needed to be doing. I just and can't her, imagine being that age, you know, that's such a formative time of life and to be so confused about what's going on in your body. I just can't even imagine. So it must have been so gratifying to at least get that question. All right, sorry to interrupt. Continue. Oh, yes, Monica, exactly. It was like to get that question and what it really did, that question, then from there allowed me to be a part of what was going on because previously I wasn't a part of it. I was just doing what I was told and it wasn't getting better. So it opened the door for me to say, well, what's working for you? What's not? What else? What are you eating? <laughs> are you sleeping? All these questions where I was like, no, I'm not really sleeping. I'm very, very anxious. This medication makes me feel sick. None of the, my peers or anyone around me understands, you know, all these things. So it opened the door for me to be involved. And obviously I took that and ran with it because it's now my career and what I do for other, other people. I ended up becoming a nurse um, because I really wanted to help in this, help people in this way. And then I studied functional nutrition and work now with uh, individuals um, to really take control of your health, to understand all the things that we can do on a daily basis to support our health. And it's because I had to go through, have still going through, uh, you know, 15, 16 year journey of figuring that out. Um, so that, you know, was really, really formative for me in being able to do this work. And it's why I care so much about it. <laughs> yeah. So similar journey for my husband is just not knowing. And so he would have these joint issues and super tired and things like that. So curious what are common symptoms and what are things to look out for for the most common types of autoimmune disorders. Maybe you could just give us a little primer on, on autoimmune. 
Yes. And shall I share my slides? Because I yeah, have a sure. images yeah. that might help. Okay. Let me share some slides with you because it, it, it makes it a little bit easier, especially if we're visual learners um, to be able to share this. Okay. We can see these. Okay. Yeah. Great. Okay. So with autoimmunity, what we know is that it affects over 50 million Americans or 20% of the population. So that's when we can talk more about why this, this might be, um, <clears throat> but it affects many of us and especially women. Women make up to 75% of this population. Does not mean that men are not affected like your husband too, but definitely um, being a woman is a risk factor this day for autoimmunity. So these are the images I kind of wanted to show you when we talk about what is autoimmunity or what are the symptoms. So with autoimmunity, I mean, just generally, it's when the immune system attacks your own tissue, self tissue, the immune system is there to be able to protect us from foreign invaders. Autoimmunity is when it ends up mounting an attack against our own tissues or something in our body. And what you can see here in this image is that there are organ specific autoimmune diseases and non organ specific autoimmune diseases. So, and, and also you might not fit into one of these categories. And this is what I really wanna get across as well. So depending on where the immune system is mounting its attack or which tissues are involved, that's gonna be the um, disease that you are then diagnosed with. So. If your immune system is mounting an attack against your thyroid, then you would be diagnosed with Hashimoto's or Graves' disease. Um, if it's mounting an attack against your stomach or, or your you know, intestines, it could be ulcerative colitis or Crohn's or pernicious anemia here. Then you can see on the other side, the non-organ specific conditions can be things like lupus, like rheumatoid arthritis, where it's affecting widespread joints in the body. Christina, can I interrupt for just a second? Because yeah. I have so, I am on thyroid medication mm -hmm. for a slow thyroid. And I know so many people who are also on medication. Is that the same thing as thyroiditis or is that something else? I'm so glad you asked that question. So with the thyroid, I think about 90% of cases of hypothyroid or low thyroid are autoimmune in nature not all of them. You can have low thyroid for a number of different reasons, you know, um, where your hormones might be affecting it or other things that are going on that can cause low thyroid production. Um, if your adrenals are affected or all these things, but a big percentage, again, not everyone. So, but a big percentage can be due to autoimmunity. So the way to test that is to measure your thyroid antibodies, which aren't always tested when you go to an endocrinologist. So you have to specifically ask for your thyroid antibodies to be tested. And I have a, um, a sheet, a lab sheet of labs you can ask for, for specifically for thyroid that I can give to you and you all if anyone wants it. Yeah, that um, would be great. I'll be sending out an email to everyone who signed up. And so I'll definitely include that information. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, you know, the other thing about autoimmunity, I've, I've been working in this and, and working with hundreds of people over the years to support them in this. And it can be really um, tough navigating our medical system. Our medical system, as a nurse, you know, I worked in intensive care in cardiology as a cardiac specialist, um, a lot of different areas in the hospital. It's really, really great for when we have acute issues. If I have a heart attack, like take me to the place where I used to work as a nurse, you know, any of these acute issues. But when it comes to chronic, especially autoimmune issues where our symptoms might be more quote unquote vague. Um, they might be more like fatigue. They might be more like just achy brain fog. It's really hard to navigate. And even, you know, really, really great practitioners sometimes aren't going to necessarily go get the, you know, the, the testing or like the information that we need, especially with thyroid conditions. I find it a kind of, you know, we really have to kind of work in partnership. And this is where our own personal empowerment 
uh, really comes into play where, you know, we don't have to turn into many doctors or, you know, get a, like our medical degree from Google. I've like <laughs> semi did this when I was younger. We don't have to do that, but I'm going to give some tips as to what we can do to feel really empowered and informed. So we know what to ask for and we can get what we need so that we can, you know, then support our body and health. So um, maybe, okay. So you, you, you'll probably get to this and just tell me to be quiet if you, if you, no. if you're not to it yet, but you know, I noticed a, a lot of these on the organ specific are itises, which means inflammation. And so it also makes me wonder if just general, I mean, general inflammation is so toxic to our body in the long run. And, you know, it is things like that leads to Alzheimer's and things like that. So it seems very systemic. Um, and so do you find that a lot of these um, are related to inflammation? Yeah, so when we're talking about inflammation, it really is, it just means an activation of our immune system. So uh. inflammation is a healthy response. When we get a cut, we want inflammation because what it does is it there's characteristics of it that are redness heat swelling and pain we actually want that immune response to flood white blood cells and everything we need to that site so it can start to heal but if you get a cut it's red it's swollen or if you sprain an ankle you know it's painful and there's heat so we want that immune response because that's what keeps us alive but we want it to turn off so the problem is not acute inflammation, but it's when inflammation becomes chronic is when we start to have these problems. And why inflammation can become chronic can be from many different things like diet, you know, for having inflammatory foods or um, our digestive system, if we're not properly digesting and absorbing our foods, um, stress, lack of sleep, um, you know, all of these different kind of lifestyle factors can be things in my experience it's usually not just one thing it's usually a couple of things that can be adding to this chronic low level inflammation that can then affect like you said monica many different disease states low level inflammation that is chronic due to our diet or a sedentary lifestyle or digestive issues or stress um, can influence cardiovascular disease, Alzheimer's, absolutely turning on or off of autoimmunity as well and so many different things. So yeah, it's kind of one in the same if that answered, answered your question. Yep, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So that's here, the system-wide inflammation. So you could be reading this and you could, you could have a diagnosis. Again, these are not exhaustive. Let me see if I can find this next slide. Here we go. This might be helpful too to see this visual. So there's over a hundred, I think there's like 120 autoimmune disease categories and there's more than this, but you can see here that they are kind of widespread. And depending on which area of your body is affected, that's gonna be what is diagnosed, but remembering that the root is the immune system. So although you may go to an endocrinologist for your thyroid or a rheumatologist for your um, joints or um, a dermatologist for your skin, if you have something like psoriasis, they seem very disjointed, right? And in our medical system, that's kind of how we treat it, but they're all related because it's all the immune system having an inflammatory response that we have to get to the roots and understand why. Why is the immune system doing this? So you can see here, it can be kind of challenging. This is another reason why going through the medical system is a little challenging because there's not necessarily such thing as an autoimmune doctor. The closest would probably be a rheumatologist um, as they see a lot of those issues. But you can see here, depending on what's going on, you may be seeing many different specialists and they might not be talking to each other about what's going on. So being able to like pull these pieces together, get to the roots and see what can we what can we be doing? So I just wanted to share that visual. It can be helpful. Yeah, that is a great visual. And we have, um, we do have a question mm -hmm. from Wendy that's 
that says when you have co a complex mix of symptoms that aren't getting to the root of it, how to find out what diagnostics to seek out, whether it's covered by insurance or not. Mm -hmm. And that's a great question. So it must be very confusing when you're going to all of these specialists, but no one is really tying it together. So do you have any tips for trying to get to the root of it? Yeah. So let's, I can talk through how I look at it with these kind of three tiers of, of autoimmunity and the three pillars, I mean, of autoimmunity and what we can kind of look at. So I will talk through it too. Um, and, but yes, I totally hear you with that. And that can really be the problem. There are, you know, certain practitioners and doctors that specialize more in getting to the root, but let me talk through it a little bit more and we'll see if we kind of clear that, clear that Great. up and then I can, yeah, we'll I'll make sure we answer that. Cause that's the question. <laughs> um, so what causes autoimmune disease? Um, so it's said that one, about one third of our likelihood of developing autoimmunity is to do with genetics. Um, so genes are not your destiny though. I really want to highlight that genes are not our destiny. Um, but you know, I inherited some gene, my, like I said, I have autoimmunity in my family and you might find that autoimmunity, um, you don't necessarily have all the same autoimmune condition, you know, you might have different ones, but there is a genetic component and some genes that are associated with it. But again, it is not everything. So two thirds or maybe even more of developing an autoimmune disease have to do with environment and diet and lifestyle. And diet and lifestyle, we'll talk a little bit more into environment can, can mean things sometimes even like infections can sometimes be triggers, um, like different, you know, toxins or things in our environment. But basically we can think of it as things that we can influence. So in a way it's really good news because there's a lot that we can do to support our health and to support our body and to support a healthy immune response. So what a, one concept I wanted to introduce is something called the ATMs of health, and it's just the antecedents, triggers, mediators. Um, so when we're trying to understand why we developed an autoimmune condition or what led to that, I always do with my clients, I create something called a functional timeline. And we look at literally what's been going on for you from birth until now. And it helps us to really understand your story because Let's give an example of, okay, two people who have a diagnosis of irritable bowel syndrome. Let's just say that. And we, you know, in our medical system right now, we might treat them with the same thing, something to stop diarrhea or, you know, symptoms or something like that. But when we actually look at their story, their timeline, we can see the first person developed their irritable bowel after they had a really bad bout of food poisoning. So we know that there's something going on with the bacteria in their gut. So then we know the treatment is gonna be different. The second person started to get irritable bowel after starting a really stressful job. So we can see, oh, this has nothing to do with your gut bacteria. This has to do with your gut brain connection and stress. So you can see how like understanding our, our individual stories really matters for knowing how to move forward. So when we look at antecedents, these are just things like genetics like our, you know, what, what genes we have, um, family history. We can't control these, they just are, but they can be helpful to understand. Then we look at triggers, which as we're kind of going along in our timeline, triggers can be seen as the final tipping point leading to the expression of illness. So I want all of you to kind of think back right now, um, and you can do this later too, what might be some of the triggers for you, for me, I had previously, before getting sick, I had taken a ton of antibiotics for acne and skin issues. So my gut bacteria was really out of balance. Um, it, a lot of times it can be um, periods of really high stress that can sometimes tip things over the edge. It can be pregnancy or hormonal shifts um, can be a common one too. There can be many different um, triggers, but it can be helpful to kind of look through and see um, what they might be for you. Christina, do you see menopause being a common trigger? It definitely can. Yeah. Our hormones can definitely affect 
our immune system, especially thyroid. Um, I see that. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. And then mediators, it's just really a, a word for what makes how you feel better or worse. Um, so these are the things that I work to identify in the clients that I work with. We understand your triggers and antecedents. And then we say, well, what are the things that make you feel better or worse? So this can be diet, hydration, sleep, movement, stress management, proper digestion, all these different things. And I, they're going to be really similar for a lot of us. Um, but we each have unique mediators too. Okay. So I'm just going to see if these are kind of relevant. Yeah. So the, I mean, the main treatment for autoimmunity right now, they'll often say like, there's no quote unquote cure, you know, I mean, that was what was told to me when I was diagnosed was oops, like this, sorry that you drew this card in your life. Like, you know, you're going to be on these meds for really long term and, you know, medications we need, we need both we need medications at different times and we need holistic approaches at different times. There's no, you know, either or, um, but you know, the conventional treatment right now is suppressing inflammation and managing symptoms. A lot of times rather than getting to the roots. Um, so we can kind of use it in conjunction. So again, the good news is there are aspects we can influence. <laughs> and this is what I really, really, really want to highlight because it can feel, it can feel very overwhelming um, it can really feel like you're not getting answers. It can feel exhausting to have to deal with these symptoms and, and to just be doing your best to want to feel better. And really, really, truly, there are aspects we can influence. No matter where you're at or how you're feeling or what you're dealing with, we're all going to be different. But there are things that we do have in our control and in our influence that can make a big difference. So I just really want to highlight that as well. So let's see, do we have any? No, I really I want um, you to talk about your three pillars of health. Will you get to that in your? Yeah, spot? let's do oh, that. Okay. I'm kind of like trying to feel into what's the most, uh, <laughs> what's the most helpful right now. Yeah, I, um, think the, I think the three pillars would be great. Yeah, okay. So when we, when I'm thinking about, supporting autoimmunity or getting to the roots. Actually, I wanted to show this picture because you can see up here where we have this organ system diagnosis, this tree, these organ system diagnoses that we saw in that picture, right? Where we saw like the thyroid, we saw the lungs, the skin, all this. This is usually where we're kind of working in our conventional medical system, where I worked as a nurse a lot in this area. And when we want to get to the roots, um, like that question that was asked, what do we look at? You know, how do we do that? And so it's really just understanding not just what disease do you have, but why, why do you have it? And that's really the question is why. And when we look at these roots, we can see things like looking at sleep and relaxation, exercise and movement, nutrition and hydration, relationships and networks, like environmental pollutions, all, all these different things that can influence the why of what we've, we've um, been diagnosed with. And this quote that I often pull up is, if you're sitting on a tack, the solution is to find and remove the tack, not treat the pain. So it just kind of illustrates that, right? We wanna find and remove the tack is what we're really thinking about. So when it comes specifically to autoimmunity, I, over the years have been able to see that there are three kind of main pillars or areas that we want to look at when it comes to getting at the roots. A lot of times we might just be um, starting to understand the nutrition piece of it and kind of dive in there, but there's sort of three that we really want to look at. So there's nutrition and digestion. Um, it matters, you know, food is fuel, food is information. So it really does make a difference in terms of, I think, what we're fueling our body. I remember working with a client who was a, an older gentleman for a while. And it wasn't until he heard the phrase food is information that he understood, oh my gosh, wait, okay. So I can use this information to tell my body different things, to send different signals. So that for him was like, he needed to have that kind of moment to really understand um, that it makes a difference. And we can, if we can talk deeper into that too. I put digestion here as well, because our gut, 
our digestion is where food meets our physiology. It's where it, our food meets our immune system. So whenever there is immune dysfunction going on in the case of autoimmunity or inflammation in general, we wanna look to the gut. We wanna say what's going on at the place where food meets our physiology. So you hear a lot about gut health. I'm sure people have heard a lot about this coming up, um, but that's what we mean. So optimizing digestion. And I'm guessing your analogy of food is information the digestion piece is that sometimes the information isn't translated because of breakdown in the digestion. Yes, that is such a great way to think about it. Absolutely. Like that, that's it, right? We can be eating this great information, but if we're not absorbing it or digesting it, if we're really constipated or have loose stools, or there's an imbalance of good and bad bacteria, or there's inflammation in there. Yeah. It's harder to get the information. Totally. Yeah, so then there's inflammation and immunity. And this is just really understanding why, why is the immune system mounting an attack? What's going on? There has to be some kind of trigger for the immune system to be doing this. So this can be investigating things. It can be, you know, digestion, looking at gut health. It can be things like underlying infections. Um, it's really asking why is the immune system on overdrive? So I think through clearing, calming, uh, enhancing, and modulating the immune system. I kind of look through like a framework to do this, but it's really just understanding or asking why. Why might the immune system be on overdrive? It can also be due to stress or being in a constant state of fight or flight. I will tell you, that's probably the biggest one <laughs> that I see. And, and a lot of us, you know, are in that place where we're in a constant state of alert or fight or flight a lot of the time. And that can absolutely in and of itself affect our digestion, affect our immune system, affect our nervous system. So this is kind of investigating further. And then stress and mindset has its a whole own pillar because it is huge in the development and persistence of an immune system that is dysfunctioning. And I, again, I can't highlight that one strongly enough. Like I could put it number one, <laughs> but it's kind of different for every person. So any questions about this, like looking at the three pillars? Well, it's interesting for me and, you know, everyone, please feel free to write your questions in the chat area. But what the three pillars makes me think is almost like the nutrition and digestion piece and the stress and the mindset piece are the limbs of the tree. The inflammation and immunity is almost like the trunk. And then the roots are more like, you know, your background, your genetics or whatever. And so it is, I do love how you had that image of a tree because it makes it very visual. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this inflammation and immunity, when we look through, for example, this, like this, this framework of clear, calm, enhanced modulate, I wish I had like three hours with everyone. We could go I know. Like deeper into <laughs> things, but is really thinking, well, we'll just look at the first step clear. What can, what can we clear that might be adding to an immune response? Is it clearing the cabinets of processed foods? that might be interfering with this? Is it clearing our lives from excess stress or clearing our calendars? <laughs> like, is it clearing infections? And by infections, I mean either like underlying, sometimes underlying infections like an Epstein-Barr or in my case, I had chronic Lyme was, Lyme disease was part of what was going on. I had to kind of clear that. Um, it can be, it can be clearing um, an imbalance in bacteria in the gut. You know, it can be, there's things like, what can we clear? But we can start super simply. So wherever you are right now, even if you're not working with a practitioner or anyone that has um, the ability to like do a stool test to see if you have an imbalance of bacteria, like I'm using that as an example, but that's not even the first place to start, right? Like, can we clear our cabinets of processed food? Can we clear our diaries to see if we have more space to actually rest and breathe? It just really things like this. I can't emphasize how important. I think a lot of times when we get into the holistic health world, we can 
start to think, oh my gosh, I have the control. Oh my gosh, I have the control. There's so many things I have to do to be healthy right now. And it really is a lot more simple than we can make it. Um, there's a lot of different things we can do, but really just coming back to these basics of, um, you know, what can I clear? The second, like, you know, sort of pillar of that is calm. How can I calm the immune system? So that can be by flooding the body with really nourishing foods, anti-inflammatory foods, lots of good veggies um, and fruits, good quality proteins, you know, like how can I calm that? How can I calm my nervous system? Maybe you use breathing. I can teach you all a really easy breathing technique to do to help calm. So it's really kind of using tools like the functional timeline. Um, I always use food and symptom journaling, different things so we can understand what, what needs to be cleared and calmed for you because we're all at different places even if we have the same diagnosis. Christina, can we dive into that? Just to, can, can we go through each pillar just a little bit more in detail, like going through some of your nutrition and digestion suggestions? Mm hmm. Yes. So let's see. My I should have some more slides here to do. Let me just. OK, cool. So in terms of nutrition, I'm sure that's what everyone most everyone's questions are, are about nutrition to go. You could like let me know in the chat, too. But usually that's what um, <clears throat> that's what we want to know. What can we eat or what should we eat for autoimmunity? So firstly, it's bio individual. It really is like. If I've learned anything over doing this work over the last several years is that we are all really quite different and we have to just honor that there's no one size fits all. There's no autoimmune diet. There's only the Christina diet, the Monica diet. There's, you know, it's so I just want to highlight that there's definitely, you know, principles that we can all start with and things we can use to learn but it really is, it is individual. So I'm really and not is that basically that. saying like, you know, you might be gluten intolerant, but, um, but whole grains is actually really good for me. Yes. Yeah. Let's like something like dairy, right? Like, I mean, dairy can be quite an inflammatory food and I'll talk about how we can use elimination diets to help us figure this out. But for, you know, one of my clients, she's super intolerant, allergic to dairy, can't. It causes inflammation in her body like that when she has a little bit. I have gone through a process of figuring this out. When I eat dairy, I feel okay. But if I eat a lot of it, I break out on my chin. I start to notice hormone imbalances. We learn these things about ourselves so that we have our own personal guidelines. We can understand if you're in a place right now and you're like, I have no clue what works for me, that's okay. There's ways to figure it out. That's what I help people do is really understand that. But it is, yeah, it is. I just want to highlight that it is going to be individual. There's no It'd one. It'd be nice thing. to go through just a quick list of, you know, like what are common inflammatory foods, like you mentioned dairy. Yeah. So I have that in a couple slides. We'll okay. talk about the elimination diet. Um, and I think the other thing too is understanding the first place to start is like food is fuel, food is information. So a huge component of autoimmunity, like our immune system is a nutrient hog. We need tons of nutrients on a daily basis for our immune system to function. If we're deficient in nutrients like vitamin D, vitamin B, magnesium, iron, zinc, we're going to feel it, you know, we, and, it, and it also can influence and add to auto autoimmunity or like a, a dysfunctioning immune system because you can think of it as the food, the immune system doesn't have the building blocks or information it needs to just hum along and do what it needs to do so in this chart here it just shows some common nutrient deficiencies um so you can see you know even with like a magnesium deficiency you can experience fatigue, irritability, muscle tremors, brain fog. This doesn't mean if you have any of these symptoms, you absolutely have a deficiency in this, you know, but um, zinc, you know, is a really important nutrient for the immune system. If we're low in zinc, we can, we'll be able to, you know, our immune system will be affected. Vitamin C, lowered immunity, slow wound healing. So all this to say is that it's really important to get in 
good food. We talk a lot about what do we avoid and what do we not want to eat. It is more, <laughs> just as more important to flood the body with nutrients. And you, the best way to do that is through food. So that's leafy greens, getting in your veggies, seeing if you can challenge yourself to a one, two, three veggie rule, one serving of veggies at breakfast, two at lunch, three at dinner, <clears throat> something like that <clears throat> to start thinking about nutrient density. What can you bring in? So I just want to start there. <laughs> um, Christina, we have a question from Barb about how can we get nutrient testing? Can this be done through our doctor's office or do we need to see a specialist? <clears throat> Yeah. I mean, there's like, there's ways that you can, I mean, something like vitamin D, your doctor is going to be able to test that. That actually came to light a lot more um, because of everything going on with COVID. So that's a much more common one that you could probably get. And so you want your vitamin D to be a good level. Um, you can usually get your vitamin B tested um, with like a, your regular doctor, but you can ask. I would just ask, you know, if there's, if they test some of those, um, those would be kind of the big ones, vitamin D and vitamin B that they test. Other ones, I don't think I've ever been tested for zinc or magnesium or any of those, but what you can do is just work to get in a variety of foods and eat nutrient, nutrient dense foods that are going to support your body in all these areas. So um, How about supplements, Christina? Do you, do you believe in supplements? Yeah. So, I mean, supplements, I think are a way to get you from deficiency to sufficiency. So if you're super deficient in vitamin D, we know one of the best ways to get vitamin D is from the sun. But if we live in Seattle, that's hard to get that. Um, there are food sources too, but you, you might need to supplement with that if you are deficient. So I see supplements as a way to get you from deficiency to sufficiency, but ideally we're at sufficiency and we're just using food, eating a rainbow, focusing on the nutrient, most nutrient dense foods we can eat to support our body. And we're not relying on supplements or nutraceuticals. Um, there are a few that like, you know, may support us throughout the course of our life, but ideally we'd get what we need from food. Someone was just saying that um, they had to eliminate most of the supplements because of a lot of nausea and stomach aches. And sometimes I notice the same thing, especially with like B complex or niacin can, can give me, you know, like a stomach ache. And do you find that a lot? And do you have suggestions? Yeah. So yeah, B vitamins, eat it with food, try eating it with food or taking it with food. Don't take it on an empty stomach. That can be common with B vitamins, I would say. Um, yeah. And how and about other supplements? Are you just, you know, it sounds like your primary recommendation is just trying to get as much as you can through your diet. Yeah. I mean, the, like I said, if you are deficient, you, you know, what we can do sometimes, what I see a lot of people do, and I've done is we see someone promoting like, oh my gosh, this turmeric supplement or this fish oil, or this like digestive thing or this whatever is going to help me and it's going to solve my problems. And we end up with these, like what I call a supplement graveyard. And I have had a supplement graveyard because we're just, we want to feel better. We're like, this will be the thing. Yeah. My friend felt so much better with this. The problem is that sometimes there are, we have to look at the quality of the supplements. You know, is it really like, is it pharmaceutical grade? Is it really helping us get from deficiency to sufficiency? Also, is it true for us? Do we have a deficiency that we need to have this thing? Or do we, do we have a reason? Like, is this for me rather than is this for someone on the internet? Um, that's kind of the question to, to, to ask. And, um, and how do I feel? So when I, I have people write down their supplements and kind of track it and say, well, why did I introduce this? What do I notice? Is it helping me? How long have I been taking it? So we shouldn't be on like, 20 plus supplements. Like we just shouldn't, unless, you know, it's for a period of time where it's been prescribed from a practitioner and we're really working to kind of treat something or get us again from deficiency to sufficiency. Um, but just being cautious of, of that and really asking yourself if you need it. Cause I see people will come in with like bagfuls of stuff and they're like, I'm taking like all of these. And we end up 
saving people lots of money because we're like, okay, why did you start taking that one? How does that feel? I have no idea. I don't think it's helping. Actually, it makes me feel worse, right? Like it's, we just have to be discerning about it. But I, yeah. I have a couple of supplements that I use for my body that a natural, I work with my naturopath on that um, support me. Yeah. That's great. We could, I'm sure we could spend an entire hour on just supplements alone. So we won't get into too much more detail, but if you do have any recommendations on picking good quality ones, or maybe you can include that in what you send out afterwards. But yeah, that's, we have about 10 minutes. So okay. just wanted to give you a quick time check. Okay, let's do it. Let's make sure we talk about these inflammatory foods and then we can just do questions. So um, the idea of an elimination diet, maybe if anyone's in the chat, maybe let us know if you've ever done an elimination diet or not. But the idea of an elimination diet is that we remove certain inflammatory foods for a period of time to allow our body, our immune system, our tissues to get a break, to not be exposed to these foods. Then after, you know, kind of depends on what you're doing, but like three, four weeks, maybe sometimes longer, we bring these foods back in systematically and with intention. So we're able to assess how you feel when you have that food. So an elimination diet is intended to be done for a period of time not necessarily forever to gather information. So I just showed an example here of like a super basic elimination diet where you avoid the top seven um, common infla potentially inflammatory foods. I say potentially because you see eggs are on here. This is an example. Eggs are really nu nutritious food, a great source of protein. They have nutrients like choline in them. They're wonderful. If you can tolerate eggs, great, eat eggs. If you cannot tolerate eggs, they can be adding to an immune response. So I just want to put this caveat in here. Don't read this and think, oh, I, will, I should never eat any of these if I have an autoimmune disease. This is part of an elimination diet. Any elimination diet like the autoimmune paleo or like, you know, GAPS diet or well, like there's all these different types of diets. They're all elimination diets where the goal is to be able to gather information. So processed foods, obviously refined sugars and sweeteners we know are kind of, they're not giving us good information. Sugar can be quite inflammatory. Um, I say the biggest, if we look at the top three that I always look at first, when we're thinking of, when we talked about that, like clear in the um, immune under in uncovering inflammation are gluten, dairy, and sugar. I always look at gluten, dairy, and sugar first and do a trial where we avoid gluten, dairy, and sugar to be able to then see how do you feel without that? And then how do you feel when you bring that back in? So you're able to then understand and start to create a diet that works for you. And on this side, you can see all the foods that we definitely want to include, um, you know, meat and poultry. If you eat animal protein, um, if not, there's, you know, different, um, plant sources of protein, like legumes, um, and different veggies, um, starchy veggies and non-starchy veggies. So starchy veggies are like, you know, sweet potatoes and, and squash and pumpkin and, you know, things like that, that can give us vegetable sources of carbohydrates. Um, sea vegetables is a thing you could find it in Seattle, not everywhere. Um, fruits, nuts and seeds, gluten-free grains, legumes. And again, this is going to be individual. You might be someone that really doesn't do super well with any kind of grains. And again, this is the process and benefit of working through these steps to figure this out. So this is kind of a template and an idea of where to start with something like an elimination diet so you can gather more information. Christina, how long do you need to remove those things from your diet before you start reintroducing them back? You know, I usually, it, it kind of depends where you're at for some people. If this is like, feels really, really hard. I'm like, cool, give me two weeks. Let's do two weeks and see how you feel. But typically four weeks, like 30 days is usually a good amount of time, but you can start if that feels super daunting and you're like, not a chance, start with two weeks, see what you notice, right? This is all an experiment. And then you want to ask yourself the question, do my symptoms feel like they've come to enough of a baseline that I could tell a difference if I reintroduce some of these foods? So your symptoms doing an elimination diet, your symptoms don't have to necessarily come to zero. 
say you're troubleshooting joint pain and you do this elimination diet and your symptoms, you notice less brain fog, your joint pain goes from a six out of 10 to a two out of 10. Ask yourself the question, are my symptoms at enough of a stable baseline that if I brought in something different, I'd be able to tell because you, where you might be right now would be like, I would have no clue. I have bloating all the time. I have pain all the time. It might be, I don't know. I can't answer that. So we have to do a bit of clearing in order to be able to feel that again, I could go into this for like another hour or two. So yeah. I'm just trying to get as much helpful stuff out that I can. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm going to be selfish for just a moment because I don't necessarily suffer from autoimmune, but I do suffer from low energy. And would you recommend doing like a, a, an elimination diet for low energy or other kind of symptoms as well? Or would you just tweak your diet for, for energy specifically? Yeah. So I think absolutely like it's, it's worth, if you're curious about it, um, especially if you've noticed thyroid issues too, I think absolutely you can experiment with removing even if you just wanted to try gluten dairy and excess refined sugar that could be a great experiment you know for a couple of weeks to see what do i notice here mm -hmm. um with fatigue again when we actually get to the roots of these things there's so many different things that can be contributing um, to that overall sense of fatigue, what we're just talking about nutrition, you want to make sure that you're balancing your blood sugar, that you're getting in good nutrients to give your body that, but I, yeah, it could, you could definitely experiment. Mm -hmm. You know, we only have a couple minutes left. There aren't um, a lot of questions coming in, but please ask your questions if you have them. But I did want to ask you um, to kind of wrap up about the blog that you wrote that I enjoyed so much about shoulds. Can you talk to us a little bit about shoulds? Because like this, an elimina elimination diet is pretty challenging. Mm -hmm. So help us understand what you described in that blog. Yes, absolutely. So this, and I'm so glad that you're asking this too, because it can feel really overwhelming. Like I said, we get to a point where we're like, oh, wow, I am empowered. I can make changes to my health, but then it can start to feel like a full-time job where we're like, oh, well, if I'm not doing everything perfectly, if I'm not eating the perfect diet, if I'm not meditating for 30 minutes, if I'm not doing you, oh my gosh, it can get crazy. And more often than not, I have individuals and women coming to me in that place now where it's like, I try, you know, I'm working with a couple of these different things, but man, is it overwhelming? And I just feel, I just feel guilty all the time. I feel stressed all the time about this. And so what, like I said, stress is one of the main pillars. So if we are thinking about trying something or a, bringing a, an intervention for our health into our life, and it makes us more stressed, or it makes us feel worse about ourselves, it's not for us. <laughs> so if it doesn't work for you, it doesn't work. And that's really the thing that I want to drive home to is like, there's a million and a half things we should, could be doing for our health, but really just sitting with what do you have the capacity for? What feels good for you right now? And so these shoulds that we talk about, right? Like if everyone were to just think right now, what shoulds do you have? in your life? Is it, I should exercise more. Oh, I should do this elimination diet that Christina's telling me about. I should cut out gluten. You know, I should feel better with everything I've done. I should, I should, I should. And these should start to get us into a place where we feel, we feel really stressed. Like we're not doing enough all the time. So we want to drop the shoulds because when we really just ask says who, so I should be doing this elimination diet that Christina says, okay, says who? Christina, someone who, you know, you just met, <laughs> right? What do you know to be true about yourself? What do you know? Uh, what more often than not, when we ask like, who says, when we're like, I should do this, who says? The answer is like the internet <laughs> or something I read, a blog I read, right? So just acknowledging that whatever intervention you choose or whatever you're curious about, filter it through your own guidance system. How does this feel for me? And, you know, if you're reading this and you're like, actually, I feel really overwhelmed about this elimination diet. 
then maybe you just work with reducing your sugar, getting curious about your sugar cravings. That's perfect, right? And like, it works for you. So I just really wanna highlight that um, because overwhelm can be a really, really big part of all of this too. Um, and that's not, that's not helping us and we don't you know, need it to be that way. So I want you to take this information, but really filter it through what's true for you because you know best, you are your own best healer. And that's how we sit in our own seat of empowerment rather than just kind of like feeling stressed about all these things we should be doing. That's a great answer. And maybe the best way to wrap this up um, is maybe you could stop sharing the screen and then help us do the breathing exercise that you mentioned. We I could do it together maybe. love to. Yes. Okay. So I'm going to do two actually. They're okay. short. So you have two different tools. Um, one is called four, seven, eight breathing, and you may have heard of it before. It's been around for a while. I use this breath to support myself anytime I feel like I'm getting that like stressed or kind of anxious feeling. And a lot of times I do it before I eat to get myself ready. So what you want to do is put your hand on your belly or abdomen. And what we're going to do is just breathe in through your nose for a count of four and breathe in. try to feel your belly expand gently, hold your breath at the top for a count of seven or as long as you can. Don't worry if that's too much. And then you're going to exhale slowly through your mouth for a count of eight. So it's a long, slow exhale coming out through your mouth. Okay, so in your own time, again, you're gonna breathe in through your nose for a count of four, feeling your belly expand, feeling the oxygen fill your body. Hold that breath at the top gently for a count of seven. And then exhale through your mouth, long, slow exhale, telling your body and nervous system everything is okay. We'll just do one more together in your own time, breathing in through your nose for a count of four, feeling the belly expand, holding your breath at the top for seven, feeling the oxygen swirl in your whole body, and then releasing through the mouth, feeling your shoulders relax, feeling tension drop off of your body and feeling it just melt down. Okay, and so for that breath, you can just do about four, three, four of them, any time and it's going to shift you from that sort of sympathetic fight or flight into parasympathetic and it's how we start to work with that and support the body i'm going to teach you one more in our last minute because i want you to have these tools this is called a physiological sigh you might like this one better or whatever you can choose so you breathe in twice through your nose and exhale through your mouth so you go So give it a try. You breathe in through your nose, filling almost all the way up, sniff the rest of the way up, and then uh, a sigh through your mouth. And just do three of these on your own. Okay. And just notice for a second how you feel. This physiological sigh, sometimes you can see your animals doing something like before they relax or sit down. It's proven to tap into our nervous system and, and kind of reset us. So that is another good tool that you can use. <laughs> Christina, thank you so much. This has been such a great way to start the morning. I can't even tell you. <laughs> Amazing. So uh, yeah, so so Joni is going to join us now and she's going to talk about um, upcoming events. But again, Christina, this was fantastic. I'm going to be sending out these slides and we'll be posting the, um, the recording of this event so you can see it again. And it will be on our website, revel11.com. And Joni, take it from here. Well, and I just wanna say, I love your quote, you are your own best healer. And I'm gonna take that today from this moment on in my life because you, some, you really forget that. It's so easy to forget that we, we have our own empowerment, like you said. So thank you so much for sharing.